أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Now let's begin with the first verse. So this was a uh, an introduction. Inshallah, we'll uh, we'll begin with uh, the first verse. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا لا تقدموا بين يدي الله ورسوله وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ Allah says, O you who believe, do not advance before God and His Messenger and be conscious of God. Verily, God is all-hearing and all-knowing. Now, as I mentioned, the first part of this surah instructs the Muslims on how to behave in the presence of the Prophet. So, in the immediate context, this verse enjoins Muslims to avoid coarse manners in the presence of the Prophet. Reminding many of those, especially the newcomers to Islam, especially the converts and the reverts, reminding them in particular that the Prophet ﷺ is more than a tribal leader. That you shouldn't look at him as your new tribal leader. Number one, you should not, do not advance before God and the Messenger of God. Now what does this mean? Now of course, taken literally, one of the things that you do have to pay attention to is that when you're in the presence of the Prophet, you know, in the same way that it's it's bad akhlaq to walk in front of you know your father or your mother. You know, when you walk, you should walk beside them or behind them. This is part of the adab, the etiquette. That you should never walk in front of the Prophet. You need to be this sensitive when it comes to the way that you behave in the presence of the Prophet. The Mufassirin, the commentators, they say that. Do not advance before God and His Messenger means that you should not follow your own opinions rather than following the teachings of the Prophet. Now this first verse, according to Al-Qurtubi, Al-Qurtubi is one of the most prominent commentators of the Holy Quran. He speaks about the occasion of the revelation of this verse. You know, when you study the Qur'an, one of the things that you have to examine is the historical context. You know, if you don't understand the historical context of the verse, you're not going to truly appreciate the message of the ayah. So what is the historical context of this first verse? So we understand the message being that, you know, do not put forward, do not give precedence to your views over the Prophet's views and his opinions and his teachings. Now some narrations indicate that when the Prophet ﷺ was planning on going to Khaybar, you know, it seems that the Prophet made multiple visits to Khaybar, which was a fortress and it was a very important piece of land. When the Prophet wanted to go towards Khaybar, he appointed someone to look after the administrative affairs of Medina in his absence. Now, when the Prophet appointed someone, Qurtubi says that Umar ibn al-Khattab protested and said that, no, Ya Rasulullah, you should appoint such and such person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals that, you know, if the Prophet is asking for its suggestions, that's another issue. You know, because the Prophet was indeed consultative. You know, as Allah says in Surah Ashura, verse 38, that when it came to logistical issues, when it came to non religious issues, the Prophet oftentimes would consult with his companions. But when the Prophet makes a decision, you have no right to interject and to put forward your own view. So when Umar ibn al-Khattab does this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through this verse 
reprimands him and reprimands anyone who allows their own desires and their own views to take precedence over the instructions of the Prophet. So when the Quran says, do not advance before God and His Messenger, it means that do not ever allow your desires to take precedence over the commandments of God and His Messenger. If someone dies in your family, and you want you want the, their wealth to be distributed in a certain way. You have to refer to what the Sharia ah says. Do not give your opinions precedence. Do not advance. That's an example of advancing before God and His Prophet. That do not object when Allah and His Messenger announce that something is permissible. So, for example, if if two, if uh, if a husband dies, say there are a, there's a couple that's married, and the husband passes away, after four months and ten days, that widow is allowed to get married. Now, culturally, she might be shunned. Some people say, no, don't get married. She has every right to. So an example of do not advance before God and His Messenger, it's to say, no, 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 don't get married. She has every right to. She's not doing anything haram. So putting forth your opinion, you know, when it comes to the issue of polygamy, the issue of polygamy, you know, doesn't sit well with many people. Sometimes what do we say? Oh, you know, times have changed. It should be haram now. That's an example of advancing before God and His Messenger. There are there are certain things within the Sharia that you might not understand, but to but to put forth your own views and to raise them above the decree of God and His Messenger, this is this is blasphemous, and this is why some of the narrations from the Ahlul Bayt say that the struggle of the twelfth Imam will be greater than the struggle of the Prophet, because the Prophet, when he was propagating his message. He was dealing with you know idol worshippers, but the the jihad of the twelfth imam is going to be dealing with people who have their own interpretation of the Quran. That's 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 a real struggle. That when the imam alayhi speaks about the meaning of of a verse, you're going to have this person who says no, it means this. So there's going to be a battle of interpretations. So do not advance before God. And his messenger, you know, when when the when you look at the Quran, the Prophet ﷺ was not only responsible for delivering the Quran. You know, one of the functions of the Prophet, one of the duties of the Prophet, as mentioned in the second verse in Surah Al Jum'ah, الذي بعث في الأميين رسولا منهم يتلو عليهم آياته. So yetlu alayhim ayati, reciting to them the verses is one of the jobs of the Prophet, delivering the message. But in addition to delivering the verses of the Quran, the Prophet also has a responsibility to explain the meaning of the verses. Allah says in Surah 16, Surah An-Nahl, verse 44, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ That we revealed to you the reminder, meaning the Quran, so that you can clarify, so that you can explain what has been what has been sent down. So we have to understand the historical context of verses. We have to also understand the content of the verses, the meanings of the words and the phrases. Now the Prophet ﷺ lived 23 years and he was not able to explain the tafsir of every single verse to the entire community. That prophetic knowledge was transferred to Ali ibn Abi Talib. And Ali ibn Abi Talib shared this knowledge. Of course, he passed it, he passed it on to Hassan and Hussein and the, the rest of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. But you have individuals like Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet, the cousin of Ali ibn Abi Talib, who's known as Habr al Ummah, you know, the, the scholar of the Ummah. Ibn Abbas, he himself, he says that I've learned everything that I know about the Quran from Ali ibn Abi Talib. Because Ali ibn Abi Talib knows 
when the verse was revealed, whether it was revealed in Mecca or Medina, whether it was revealed, you know, during the night or during the day, he knew about the circumstances of all of the verses. And Ali ibn Abi Talib is unmatched. No one comes close to him when it comes to explaining the meaning of the Quran. And every Sunni and Shi'i Mufassar of the Quran relies heavily on Ibn Abbas. There is no Sunni narrator of hadith that can say that I'm not going to refer to Ibn Abbas. They, they would have nothing if it was not for the narrations uh, you know, transmitted to them through Ibn Abbas. So in essence, almost everything that they have traces back to Ali ibn Abi Talib. So, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا لَا تُقَدِّمُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيِ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ إِنَّ اللَّهَ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ So Qurtubi, he mentions that this verse was revealed in relation to an incident with Umar ibn al-Khattab where the Prophet appointed someone and Umar ibn al-Khattab objected to, uh, to that appointment. Now if you go to the second... Uh, the second verse. So the first instruction with respect to how we should interact when we when we how should we interact with the prophet is that do not put forward your opinions when the matter has been decided by God and his messenger. In fact, not only should you submit to the prophet Allah even explains how you should submit. So it's not enough to just obey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah An-Nisa verse 64, He speaks about the way in which you should submit to the commandment of the Prophet. Allah says in Surah 4, Surah An-Nisa verse 64, فَلَا وَرَبِّكَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ But no, by your Lord, they will not believe. Meaning that you have no iman. That your iman is deficient. You have not tasted the sweetness of faith until what? حَتَّى يُحَكِّمُوكَ فِيمَا شَجَرَ بَيْنُهُمْ They will not understand the, the reality, the na true nature of faith until they have made you the judge between them and their disputes. Conflict is natural when you when you have a large group of people, when you have a community. Allah says they will they, they are not true believers until they make you the judge, Ya Rasulullah, in matters of dispute. Thumma. Now, when they refer to you, Ya Rasulullah, when they have arguments, when they have disagreements, and you give them your judgment, how should they react to your judgment? Is it enough for them just to begrudgingly obey? No. Even begrudgingly, even, even if someone who begrudgingly obeys the Prophet, that's not acceptable. And find no resistance in their souls. To what you have decreed and surrendered in full submission. So Allah says, not only are you to obey the Prophet, you have to willingly and happily obey the Prophet. So someone who begrudgingly obeys the Prophet is someone who is deficient in Iman. You know, let alone, I mean, we have examples of. Some Sahaba who disobeyed the Prophet. So, for, I mean, they're munafiqeen. Anyone who disobeys the Prophet and doesn't repent is a munafiq. But even the ones who obey the Prophet, but they do it begrudgingly, meaning that they do it reluctantly, Allah says they don't have true iman. So, do not advance before God and His Messenger means that not only do you give precedence to the prophet not only do you 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 follow him instead of your desires but you wholeheartedly submit to him you wholeheartedly obey the prophet are the fatwas of the ayatollah as sacred as the order of the prophet 
or is there room for a difference of opinion and because the scholars are not infallible now in the the opinions that scholars give of course are not just their opinions their their opinions that are based on their their deduction of the primary sources so you know when someone asks them a question if there is if it's explicitly mentioned in the quran and in the hadith and they've determined that they are justified in referring there there's enough evidence for us to to rely on certain traditions they're putting forth opinions that are that are rooted in the primary sources now in the absence of explicit uh explicit evidence they still use a methodology that has been that has been endorsed by the sharia so even when we speak about scholarly opinions now as a muqallid if you're not a scholar that yes that the views of uh, of the maraja they are as binding as uh as the uh, as you know the words of the prophet and the imams because the imams of ahlul bayt wassalam, even in their life even in their lifetimes they referred their followers to pious scholars to people who had knowledge and piety so for example i'm not sure if i mentioned this in our sessions but there was an individual who came to imam ali ibn musa Rida in medina and he's from qom He's from Iran. And he says to the Imam that, Ya ibn Rasulullah, I live far away from you. And when I have questions, I'm unable to travel to Medina and ask you questions. Who should I take my religion from? Who should I refer to when it comes to religious affairs? Imam Rida salam says, refer to Zakariya ibn Adam. Zakariya ibn Adam was a scholar. He was a Shia scholar, a jurist. Now my question to you is, is Zakariya ibn Adam, is he ma'asum? No, he's not masum. Is it possible for him to make a mistake? It's possible. But you and I, as non-experts, we cannot just follow what we our own opinions. We we have we refer to them, and even if they make mistakes, we are justified in the eyes of God because we referred to a pious expert. But so scholars can have a difference of opinion, but they're the di the difference of uh, of opinion among scholars is not just on whim or what's more convenient it, it's based on their their deduction of the uh, the primary uh, sources um also uh, could you elaborate a little bit more on what it means to be close to god i i really like your definition of uh, reflecting god's attributes more but it sounds like one could do a lot of that without necessarily even being aware of God, as long as they're trying to be good and moral. Um, could you explain that discrepancy? So that's a very that's a very good question, and I, I think all of us have experience with people who are decent, who who have you know very they have noble qualities. They're honest. They're generous, and. You know, if you look at the ninety-nine names of God, sometimes you see you see them manifested more in in, in non-Muslims than you do in some Muslims. However, you know, for someone, for example, if you say that you know this this non-Muslim, and again, this is assuming I'll, I'll mention certain assumptions that we're we're making. If there's someone. Who you say is, is a very decent person they're kind they're respectful they are courteous now that's fine but if they if they fail to be grateful to the to the lord who gave them the gift of existence you know so so someone who holds the door for me or expresses gratitude for the little things that I do for them as a helpless human being. You really can't say that, oh, this, so, uh, so someone, might, they might be good to you. They might be decent in their interactions with other people. But it, it would be a very bold statement to say that they are entirely decent, even though 
they completely, they knowingly reject the grace and the bounties of God. So if someone is ungrateful to God, you couldn't, you you wouldn't be able to 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 call them humble and and kind and grateful. Now to you and I, they might be that, but. You know, to to deny the existence of God. Now, again, we're, we're assuming that that this person knowingly, knowingly rejects these proofs, and their rejection is 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 rooted in in arrogance and rebelliousness. Now, is it possible? It could be possible that someone might be genuinely looking for the truth. But they, you know, they haven't they haven't come to the the right conclusion. Allah will deal with them in the way that He sees fit. But uh, but to be close to God and to truly reflect the divine attributes, you could do it to you know even Shaytan. You know anything that exists is naturally going to reflect the attributes of God to a certain extent by virtue of their existence. You know, are there non-Muslims that reflect the attributes of God more than than some Muslims? Yeah, it's possible. So, you know, you might see a Christian who reflects the attributes of God more than a Muslim. For example, the Khawarij who fought Ali ibn Abi Talib. Who's closer to God? You know, you know, a, a, a priest who who was kind and compassionate and did not reject the final message of God because of arrogance, because they just they didn't have access or they misunderstood or they just you know they didn't come to the conclusion that that was uh that was accurate who's closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a humble god-fearing priest or a khadiji who fought Ali ibn Abi Talib you know some some I would say that it's the priest who who was humble and who was courteous and kind but again we shouldn't we should also not downplay the importance of recognizing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know what would you say about someone who was raised by their parents fed clothed educated and then when this child reaches the age age of 18 he spits in the face of his parents and he says you're not my parents and he leaves someone who rejects Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and doesn't recognize the greatness of Allah and that he's the source of all of these bounties is even worse than the one who spits in the, the the face of his parents and denies all of the goodness that they have shown to him. What's the what's the difference? Now again, assuming that that rejection is is a conscious rejection. But again, if if there are non-Muslims who who are decent but they have not come to know God, the God that is is described in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may deal with them. You know, he might show them kindness and mercy. The most important thing is that there is there is that you don't reject the truth out of arrogance and rebelliousness. That there has to be sincerity in your pursuit for the truth. And Allah knows the best.